Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, the RCMP and the timeline of a rampage. That could very well have been uh, the catalyst. The chaotic scenes they encountered. From a Nova Scotia county, a national vigil. Also tonight, testing federal provincial relations. It'll be done gradually. How Canada should reopen and when. And dangerous COVID-19 misinformation. Then I see the disinfectant. The presidential suggestion experts are rushing to correct. This is The National. The RCMP revealed details today of the shocking events in Nova Scotia. And what's clear is that on the night of Saturday, April 18th, in the small community of port pic police were facing an overwhelming set of crimes. Now my count was there were over 25 separate units that had responded to that area. You know, you have to appreciate that they believed that they had that area contained. But the army of officers didn't yet know that the carnage and horror was far from over. Kayla Housel has the details of the chain of violence, some of it seemingly targeted, much of it apparently random, and all of it almost unthinkable, even now. It was a significant incident. It was a significant assault. And uh, this individual female uh, did manage to escape. And uh, that could very well have been uh, the catalyst to start the chain of events. That person was the shooter's girlfriend. Police say she hid in the woods overnight. They got that first report of a shooting at a home in the same area, port pic Officers arrived on scene at 1026 Saturday evening and found a man who said he had been shot in his car by someone in a passing vehicle that looked like a police car. I've been a police officer for almost 30 years now, and I can't imagine any more uh, horrific uh, set of circumstances uh, when you're trying to search for someone that looks like you. That first scene was chaotic. Police found several bodies, a total of 13 dead in port pic There were already several buildings engulfed in flames. Police say they learned of a possible suspect fairly early and that his home, garage and three vehicles were all on fire. They also knew he had a pistol and long-barreled weapons. What I can tell you about the weapons is, is that uh, at this point in time, uh, we've been able to uh, trace one of those weapons back uh, uh, to Canada and the remaining weapons that uh, have been recovered, uh, it's believed uh, that they were um, obtained in the United States. All night, the search for the suspect was fruitless. Then at 6.30 in the morning, Gabriel Wortman's girlfriend emerged from hiding and began providing critical information. She told police he had a replica RCMP cruiser and was wearing a police uniform. There's nothing like a, like a human source or an eyewitness. I mean, they, they can tell you things, you can ask them questions, you can have a conversation with them. More than 12 hours after that first call came in, a second series of 911 calls. The gunman shot and killed corrections officers Alana Jenkins and Sean McLeod, set their house on fire, and also killed a passerby, Tom Bagley. Then he encountered Lillian Hislop out for a walk and killed her too, before continuing south to Debert. Acting as an officer, he pulled over Kristen Beaton and Heather O'Brien and killed them. Meanwhile, Constables Heidi Stevenson and Chad Morrison used their police radios to arrange to meet near Shubenacadie. When Morrison arrived, he thought it was his colleague waiting for him in a police car, but it was the gunman who immediately opened fire. Stevenson was getting closer now. Her cruiser ended up colliding head-on with the gunman's. He shot and killed her and took her gun and bullets. Joey Weber was running an errand when he happened upon the scene. Joey knew ahead of time what was going on, and he jokingly said to his, his uh, girlfriend, Shanda, before he left the house, well, I must go out and get the, get the furnace oil and get back before that crazy guy gets down here uh, shooting people. But Weber became the next victim. The gunman set Stevenson's vehicle and his own on fire and left in Weber's silver SUV. But he had one more stop, the home of Gina Goulet. He killed her and stole her car. When he went to fuel it up at the Irving Big Stop, by chance, the police also happened to be there. They shot and killed him, ending a 13-hour manhunt nearly 100 kilometers from where it all began. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Police acknowledged that the killer's use of what looked like an RCMP cruiser gave him an advantage over them and the public. 
And as Thomas Dagla explains, for a critical period, people were in the dark about the disguise. By Sunday morning, as the gunman drove along Highway 4 in the Wentworth area, police across Nova Scotia were on alert for a fake RCMP cruiser. The public was not. Out for a walk, Lillian Hislop would have had no reason to fear the police car that approached her or the man inside who shot her. Let people know to be safe. How hard is that to do? Could it have saved your friend Lillian's life? I'm sure it could have. Police now acknowledge they learned the previous night in port of -Pic, the suspect may be driving what looks like a police car, but they found three registered Mountie-style Ford Tauruses on his properties, one in Dartmouth intact, the other two in port of -Pic, torched. It became clear on Saturday night that the suspect may be driving a mock police car. Why wait 11, perhaps 12 hours to warn the public of that? Couldn't that have saved lives? You're, you're asking me to to provide a crystal ball answer to the fact that there was this fourth unplated vehicle didn't emerge until the early morning hours. Notice that car has no license plate. Police didn't realize he had a mock RCMP cruiser on the road until the gunman's girlfriend told them. They alerted officers but waited roughly three hours to warn the public, in a tweet no less. You know, you're finding bodies, you're putting out fires, you're assisting fire department, ambulance, they're bringing in additional resources. Sometimes it's just the communication uh, gets stalled somewhere. Investigators have now found where the gunman obtained that light bar on the roof, but not where the decals were printed. His mock-up convincing enough for the shooter to pull over nurses Heather O'Brien and Kristen Beaton, among the six victims killed as police knew about the car but kept it to themselves. A critical delay that may have led to more loss. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. As all those details about the crime come out, people are also focusing today on the 22 victims. At the investigation sites all over the province and across the country, people stood for a moment of silence to honour them. And that was just one part of a whole day of remembrance. As Elizabeth Chu shows us, a virtual vigil broadcast this evening did what the pandemic had prevented. It brought those mourning together. A haunting duet. Cape Breton fiddling star Natalie McMaster playing along with a video of 17-year-old Emily Tuck, the youngest of those killed. Her father had shared the teen's recording on a Facebook page meant to bring Nova Scotians together during the pandemic. There's some fiddle for you. <laughs> Emily and her parents among those mourn today. Across Canada, but especially in this province, that has lost so much. We are shattered, but we are not broken. Governor General Julie Payette offered words of solace from the Prime Minister and Premier, a reminder of the magnitude of this loss. A neighbor and a nurse, a teacher and a friend, a Mountie and a mother, friends, colleagues and family. They represented the best of us. Your loved ones mattered. They loved, they had dreams, and they contributed to this province. The vigil was started by local residents. We just wanted to do something that would bring a, a level of comfort to so many people out there that were, that were hurting and, uh, you know, needed a way to be part of something, to, uh, to gather essentially, you know, since we cannot do it physically. This expert says that's the really important thing about vigils. The word vigil itself means to stay awake or to be made awake, essentially. So vigils usually take place late at night. And one of the most critical dimensions of a vigil is to bear witness. Actor and local resident Jonathan Torrance helped mount this unprecedented event. Somebody's brother or sister, grandparents, neighbor, friend, sons and daughters, moms and dads. And that family of three, the Tucks. Your contribution to the COVID kitchen party. Elizabeth Chu, CBC News, Halifax. Over the past few days, we've learned a lot about the 22 people who died in this attack. Some of their loved ones have shared memories and stories with us. We'll have more of those tonight, including from Nick Beaton. 
His wife, Kristen, was one of those killed. My conversation with him in about half an hour. This afternoon, there was fear that another shooter was possibly on the move in Nova Scotia, this time around Halifax. An emergency alert was sent out just after 4 p.m. telling people to shelter in place. It said police were investigating reports of shots fired in multiple communities in the Halifax area. About an hour and a half later, police gave the all clear, saying no evidence of a shooting was found. Now let's turn to the crisis you've been confronting for weeks. Nearly 1,800 new cases of COVID-19 were reported today. Canada's closing in on 44,000 since the outbreak began. But here's a different story. Zero new cases reported today in PEI and New Brunswick. In Newfoundland and Labrador, the caseload hasn't grown for seven straight days. This week has proven that our collective efforts can curb the spread of COVID-19 in our province. Yet the message remains, for now, don't let up. It points to a problem for Justin Trudeau. He's asking provinces and territories to all play by the same rules when it comes to reopening the economy. As people grow more restless, Catherine Cullen shows us how the tension is playing out. Today is an important day for our province. It won't be the return to normal so many crave, but New Brunswick is starting cautiously to reopen with measures like allowing households to spend time with one other household. I look forward to making an announcement in the future when we can open more. Yesterday, Saskatchewan announced its plans. I believe we can carefully and cautiously begin to reopen our province. Even hard-hit Ontario and Quebec are getting their reopening plans ready. It'll be done gradually. The Prime Minister said today his government wants the whole country to play by the same basic rules. Principles and um, elements that should be in place and should be followed as provinces make the decisions on how and what they will reopen. That includes standards for the level of testing and norms for workplace safety. What provinces really want from Justin Trudeau, though, is more money. I need his help. Uh, Prime Minister, if you're listening, I need your help. Help for the long-term care centres that account for well over half the deaths in Canada. We can provide funding. Uh, that will help us get through this. The federal government is still working out a plan to top up the wages of senior centre workers. But in the longer term... The Prime Minister said today there may need to be a discussion about whether seniors' residences should be subject to more federal oversight. We will take care of managing the health network, Quebec Premier Francois Legault said, but he wants the federal government to dramatically boost health care funding. Trudeau and the premiers did agree this afternoon that they will come up with a common set of guidelines for reopening. Ensuring that those reopenings themselves go well, though, is going to be a much bigger challenge. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Different levels of government do work together, as we saw today, this time to help small businesses cover their rent. We've reached agreements with all provinces and territories to lower rent by 75% for small businesses that have been strongly affected by COVID-19 for April, May and June. Government money will cover half the rent and will flow directly to landlords as forgivable loans. Landlords can keep the cash if they agree to cut the rent by 25%. Police, labour and health officials are investigating the actions of a town councillor and business person in Ontario's Niagara region. He was visibly ill with cold symptoms weeks ago but continued to work in the community. As Dave Seglins tells us, he has since tested positive for COVID-19. Open today after a deep clean, but yesterday this local grocery store shut down as police announced an investigation that is shaking community leaders. My wife and I were uh, tested yesterday and we will be self-quarantining until we find the results. At issue, Sobeys franchise owner and town councillor Ron Kaur, now in isolation with COVID-19. But the 2016 Citizen of the Year in late March, despite all the public health warnings, kept working, attended council, sniffing, coughing, clearly under the weather. As events around the globe unfold in COVID-19. Now town officials are getting tested after a second councillor, Mike Cholfi, contracted the virus and died. 
It prompted this community parade, an outpouring of grief, but also anger. Well, it's not clear who got it from whom or whether it was spread at the town council meeting. People are scared. All the health units in Canada were saying that if you don't feel healthy, stay home. Sobey's employees are now being offered testing. Some in this community are outraged. It's, it's a completely irresponsible knowing the risks, knowing that this community is made up of mostly seniors and uh, going into work at an essential service. The man at the center of this controversy declined to comment to CBC, but this case does raise larger questions about voluntary isolation and what happens if a boss puts workers at risk. Every employer is subject in Ontario to legislation that mandates that you create a safe work environment. So there are uh, regulatory violations that may have been triggered. Sobeys has temporarily taken control of this store as the company, labor, public health and police officials all try to piece together what's happened to try to figure out just how big this local outbreak could get. Dave Seglin, CBC News, Toronto. The first Canadian military members are in place at some Ontario long-term care homes. A convoy of vehicles arrived at Orchard Villa, east of Toronto this afternoon, the province's worst single outbreak with at least 40 reported deaths to date. And it's one of five long-term care homes that will get help for now. I want to make sure that the quality of service is what is uh, the best. Our elderly, uh, we hold that to, to them. The Quebec Premier, Francois Legault, says he's not ruling out taking over all private seniors' homes as they continue to be the epicenter of the pandemic in that province. Legault says he will speed up a plan to create more spacious, better-staffed public homes. Chief Medical Health Officer Dr. Shahab has signed a public health order restricting all non-critical travel into or out of northern Saskatchewan. Checkpoints have been established along all highways leading into northern Saskatchewan, where a combined 25 COVID-19 cases have been confirmed, the most of any region in the province. Yesterday, the Premier unveiled Saskatchewan's plan to reopen. Trying to protect First Nations communities has been a concern since the start of this pandemic. And as Cameron McIntosh shows us, many of them are going to great lengths to keep the virus out. All done now. The last one. Yeah. Normally a busy hub in Manitoba's north, at 10, life in a Pasquiac Cree Nation shuts down. Oh, I'm sorry, we're closing now. For those living here, a strict curfew. For those that aren't, checkpoints to keep outsiders away. So if one case gets into our community, it's going to spread like rapid fire here. And, we want and says Chief Christian Sinclair, they'll go even further, threatening eviction and banishment for any residents who repeatedly ignore physical distancing rules. We see that as endangering the lives of others in our community. It was the community members' wishes that we take uh, stronger measures. Where are you coming from? Winnipeg. Winnipeg? Okay. Across the country, similar approaches, as dozens of Indigenous communities close themselves off, restricting access and movement. For many, it appears to be working. Nationally, there are still fewer than 100 confirmed cases on reserve, spread across a few provinces. The Indigenous epidemic many fear hasn't materialized. At least, not yet. There's no martial law. It's just common sense. Grand Chief Serge Simon is with the Kanasakatake Mohawks near Montreal. Each day, they've been turning away hundreds of cars. Not just people looking for cheap gas and tobacco, but looking to shop in less infected areas. So these people can inf inadvertently or indirectly infect our people. Community spread could start that way. So that's why we took the steps to uh, put checkpoints up. In many far-flung communities, it's easier to keep people out. Still, in 2009, H1N1 gripped Manitoba's north, exposing how poorly equipped many Indigenous communities are to handle an outbreak. Experience that's influencing hard decisions, says Sinclair. But if we lose a life, that's a life we can't ever get back in our communities. So, the checkpoints and curfews will remain. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Donald Trump's latest COVID-19 comments have been called dangerous. He says he was just kidding. And then I see the disinfectant. And is there a way we can do something like that by injection, insert? Next on The National, the outcry and the incredulity. And they're on the front lines of COVID-19, but...
Who's caring for Canada's health care workers? Medical um, frontline workers can't really talk to their families about their fears because their families are already afraid. And we'll return to Nova Scotia with a special musical tribute to the lives lost this week. The world could use a hero. We're back in two minutes. Okay, I've just arrived at my school and I have 15 minutes to get what I need. My name is Michelle Jones and I am an elementary special education teacher. Now that we've just finished our first week of remote learning, I can't help but to feel a little guilty about just not being able to be there to sort my, support my students with a learning disability. The hallways are dark. Let's see, oh, here's my room. No one's here, no kids. My empty classroom. Some of the challenges I'm seeing with our physical distance is not being able to be right there to guide a student with encouraging words when they are on the right track. But overall, it's just been really challenging not to be able to do everything that I want to do for my students. My bags are packed over here, and I think I got everything. So what keeps me up at night is thinking about some of my students' home life. I know a lot of them do have mental health issues as well, and I just worry about them. Leaving my building now until who knows when, but I am hopeful that we're going to be back here this year. So many people are struggling to adapt to life during COVID, but for those who work in hospitals or long-term care homes, new dangers on the job are taking a toll on mental health. Tashana Reed looks at how some are coping. For emergency physician Dr. Roderick Lim, stress has been unavoidable. It's the safety of our colleagues that we're worried about. It's uh, getting ourselves sick. Even for frontline workers used to high pressure environments, COVID-19 has brought new challenges and anxieties. And, you know, something we never really had to worry about as much is, is you know, coming home and potentially infecting our own families. There's also the uncertainty of it all. To be honest, there's more fear. We don't know how things are going to turn out and uh, there's more sadness um, just because of the, the human toll um, that's happening. It's why psychotherapist Karen Doherty helped create the Ontario COVID-19 Mental Health Network to connect frontline workers with therapists and counselors for free therapy. Medical um, frontline workers can't really talk to their families about their fears because their families are already afraid. In the last month, hundreds of nurses, doctors and support workers have reached out for help. We're seeing a really um, a terrible anxiety about not having enough PPE. Dr. Megan Batia helped create an infographic for fellow medical residents, overwhelmed by all the new information about COVID-19. Sometimes it's like drinking from a fire hose. There's just so many new developments and changes. I um, was able to FaceTime my parents, which was really nice. Peer-to-peer -peer online support groups with fellow residents are also helping. A lot of them have been just to check in, like, are you sleeping? How's it going? Are you worried about anything? Do you want to rant about anything? For Dr. Lim, he's trying to make sure his staff has the support they need. We worry about the, the people that are maybe suffering um, silently. He wants frontline workers busy saving the lives of others to know it's okay to ask for help. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. On the day the U.S. coronavirus deaths surpassed 50,000, President Donald Trump was trying to walk back some of his own treatment ideas that medical professionals are calling dangerous, even horrifying. Katie Simpson has more from Washington. Okay, thank you very much. We're gathered. With his allies backing him up, the president used a familiar strategy to get out of his latest crisis. Donald Trump shrugged off his comments. No, I was asking a question sarcastically to reporters like you just to see what would happen. It absolutely did not seem like a joke when on live TV, Trump asked a top official to look at whether UV rays or disinfectant can be inserted into bodies as COVID-19 treatments. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside? A doctor on Trump's task force missed the apparent joke, cringing as he went on. Almost a cleaning. 
the maker of Lysol saw it necessary to put out a statement, under no circumstance should our disinfectant products be administered into the human body. So many people are listening to him. We are the epic Trump's statements are not surprising to some who point out he's made dangerous claims before. Unfortunately, the missteps, the incompetence, uh, the denial of science have led to the United States having the worst epidemic worldwide. Trump has encouraged anti-stay-at-home protests, which mostly have not followed physical distancing rules. He also promoted an anti-malaria drug without facts to back his claims. Based on what I see, it could be a game changer. The FDA says it's not a game changer, issuing a warning today about its potentially deadly side effects. The top doctors on Trump's task force, who bring credibility to the team, did not go to his daily briefing. He stuck mostly to his script, uncharacteristically ignoring reporters, bringing a fast end to his difficult day. After Thursday's performance, the White House is rethinking whether Trump needs to appear at these briefings. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. There is a lot of coronavirus misinformation and research is starting to show Canadians certainly aren't immune to conspiracy theories or the promise of strange cures. Katie Nicholson looks into why. Bad COVID information is always just a few clicks away, like this post that claims drinking fresh camel urine prevents coronavirus infection. It's not true and raises the question, who actually believes this stuff? There is a big amount of Canadians that believe in conspiracy theory. Quebec researchers have released preliminary results of a much larger study. They suggest at least one in 10 Canadians believes COVID-19 misinformation. And younger people are more susceptible. Because they are more present on the social media, so they see more of that kind of theory. The social media lab at Ryerson University analyzed 2,000 debunked posts and came up with seven distinct categories of COVID misinformation. Everything from fake cures to scams and race baiting posts. After a while, I was like, I can't trust what's coming out of um, somebody else's mouth. So as a result, I'm not going to trust anybody. And that's bad for a democracy. The lab's co-director hopes breaking it down will help people spot misinformation before they share it. But he says some people will still fall for it. A lot of it is also just them not being informed willingly. It's almost like it's willful. A recent UK study found as many as one in five believes some form of COVID misinformation over there. Canada's numbers will come into sharper focus next month when two larger university studies are released. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, two more perspectives on Nova Scotia. Reaction to today's new information from a former high-ranking Mountie and the husband of one of the victims. Everyone can imagine what that scene would have looked like. You know, multiple victims, multiple structure fires. We were checking for any survivors. We were still checking for um, any witnesses. We were looking for the suspect. The RCMP today revealing a detailed portrait, not just of the crimes in Nova Scotia, but also the response. Let's get a police perspective on what we learned today from the Nova Scotia RCMP. And joining us now is a former deputy commissioner, P.Y. Bourdois. Uh, P.Y., what was your reaction when you heard that detailed description of, of what happened in port pic I was horrified. Uh, having experienced uh, patrolling rural New Brunswick for a number of years, uh, I just can picture the initial reaction of the first responders faced with such uh, traumatic events, uh, houses burning, uh, bodies laying, laying around, it, uh, it must have been total mayhem and chaos. Uh, and the RCMP, the initial response appeared to be appropriate. They pulled in all the resources they could and within a few hours they had over 25 mark units to uh, contain uh, the area. There's been a debate this week, particularly in Nova Scotia PY, some people frustrated about what they feel is a lack of information from the RCMP before today. Others who say, look, leave, leave the, the police force alone. They're dealing with their own grief. They'll talk to us, you know, when they're ready. 
as a former deputy commissioner, what's your view on, on the way information has been made public or not made public this week? Well, I empathize with the general public because I wanted to hear more uh, during the initial uh, press conferences that I've, uh, I've uh, heard. And, however, the problem for the uh, senior management of, within the RCMP is to strike the right balance between providing enough information to the general public and yet protecting some information because of the ongoing investigations that uh, are unfolding uh, as this investigation and uh, is involving. So um, that's the reason why they were guarded in their comments. But, uh, but today... Uh, certainly provided uh, the general public, anyway, with a lot more information as to the exact chain of event of actually the uh, what transpired on Saturday uh, evening and uh, Sunday morning. Over the years, you know, I, th I think about the, the RCMP murders in, in Mayor Thorpe, Alberta. You were working at that time, uh, the, so the murders in, in, in Moncton. What, what kind of impact does this kind of thing, what kind of impact do you think the Nova Scotia shooting will have on the RCMP? Huge, huge, uh, Ian, and I'll, I'll be very candid with you. Uh, it's it's shocking. It's uh, it's nothing that you can not actually prepare for. But but yet every tragedy, such as Mayor Torp Moncton or this uh, this last tragedy, uh, forces the organization that is the RCMP to reflect back and look at uh, their training, look at uh, their equipment, and just ensure that uh, their the the policing world within the RCMP is better prepared to face such types of tragedy. So there's a lot of work ahead for the RCMP. Think back to your days on patrol in rural New Brunswick. How do you think individual members are feeling now and are going to feel, particularly in Nova Scotia, when they're out there on the road? Well, if they're out there on the road, uh, of course, it's interesting because unionization is coming for the RCMP. So they might, it might change the dynamic here as, with regards to uh, uh, patrol officers out there in the rural area. Uh, should they be uh, paired up and, uh, you know, under which types of circumstances? So I would imagine that the unionization will uh, surface uh, some of these questions in relation to officer safety out there, especially in rural areas. Always nice to, to get your perspective, P.Y. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Ian. Ahead tonight, a special musical tribute to a province coming together in every way it possibly can. But first, a message for home from a very well-known Nova Scotian. Hi, everyone. This is Sidney Crosby. I'm in Pittsburgh, but being from Nova Scotia, my heart and mind is home with all of you. I'd like to extend my condolences to all the family and friends affected by this tragedy as well to the family of Constable Heidi Stevenson from Cole Harbor, who sacrificed her life protecting others. I know we'll stick together as we always do through challenging times and help and support those who need it the most. I'm sending all my love and support back home. For the latest coronavirus pandemic updates, breaking news, and top stories. Our top priority is to get you the help you need. Download the CBC News app now. CBC Listen. Hear it all here. Download today. To my dear Nova Scotia, we are there with you in the deepest of ways. Your charitable spirit that I witnessed so much in my youth will not let you down now. That is Nova Scotia fiddler Natalie McMaster performing tonight at the vigil alongside a video of one of the victims, 17-year-old Emily Tuck, in the middle of the screen. A haunting tribute now shared with the rest of Canada. Over the past few days, we've learned something of the 22 victims in Nova Scotia, including where they were at the end, at home, or walking the dog, or on their way to work, like Kristen Beaton. Beaton was on the front lines of another threat. As a continuing care assistant with the Victorian Order of Nurses, she was worried about exposing her family to COVID-19. She had a three-year-old son, and she was also pregnant. She posted this picture in her mask and safety glasses the day before she was killed. A plea for better access to personal protective equipment. That message is already part of her legacy, thanks to her husband. 
And joining us now is Kristen Beaton's husband, Nick Beaton. And, and Nick, I don't want to add to your pain at all, but uh, describe for us how you're feeling this evening. Completely lost, um, shattered, like you could make out names, overwhelmed and, and feeling love from family and, and the neighbors and, and people from abroad, by sure, but feeling empty is the best way to say. I know the main reason you're doing this interview this evening is, is to talk about Kristen, and, and, and I will ask you about her in, in just a moment. But, but another question I want to ask you is, is something you've spoken about already this week, and that is the lack of a, of a kind of specific warning, uh, you know, when, when Kristen headed out that day. Uh, is that something that still angers you? A absolutely. It, uh... I believe deep in my heart, and first I'm going to start by saying it is not the, I call them the ground soldiers, not the officers that were risking their life that day. I don't want this pointed in that direction. They did everything they could do, and I get that, and I thank them for that. I'm blaming, when I say RCMP, I'm saying whoever's in charge of broadcast systems or, or notifying us. Like, that's not the soldiers on the ground, as I call them, like the officers that were, you know, had their, their feet on the asphalt that day. That's it's not their not their fault, but I, I, deep in my heart, believe Kristen would be here today if we had had that alert, like we got today when Halifax police put up the alert that there was a gunman. You know, everyone run inside; they were safe. So yeah, which, which suggests that, that maybe people like you speaking out have already had an impact in that regard. Uh, Superintendent uh, Darren Campbell with the Nova Scotia RCMP was asked today about people who are upset about the lack of a warning or, or uh, you know, an alert going out uh, after this incident happened and, and listen to what he said in answer to that. Um, they have every right to ask those questions. Uh, they have every right uh, to be angry. Um, you know, public trust, as I said, is, is, is so important and uh, it's not something that you, uh, you it's gained easily. Um, it takes a lot of work and it's lost very easily. Nick, your reaction to that? Oh, I, I was talking with someone else today, and, and the big thing I think that we need is transparency. Like, we stop hiding behind your unmarked cars. You know, like, make us feel safe again. Wear your badge with honor. Um, you know, wear the, you know, the marked car. You know, pull up to kids playing basketball or, you know, what I mean, guys. You know, whatever. Like, just... You know, we we got to build this together, and this, you know, he. When I say this, the the low life that was that was going around shooting that day, did this to take that from us, and we need to restore it. And uh, you know, the, with failure for the broadcast system, for the lack of even me knowing anything, I don't know anything yet. All as I know is my my wife isn't coming home, and I'm not having my unborn baby, and Dax will grow up the rest of his life without a mom. That's all I know. Last thing, and, and you know, we have about a minute, and and I'm sure we could talk about this for a long time. But let's finish with you telling me a little bit about your wife, Kristen. Kristen, she was she was wonderful. She was amazing in every way, and I said it multiple times. She loved she loved Daxton more than life itself. Like it was just unreal to see, and. I could go on about her for days and days. I just want to use this opportunity too to talk about Kristen's fight for PPE, to get personal protective equipment for for the frontline workers and and get them what they need. Nick, uh, I know. I, well, I can't even imagine what kind of week it's been for you. Uh, so we really appreciate you taking the time with us tonight. Thank you. Thanks. And a little later on the national, we will pay tribute to all 22 of the lives lost this week. But first, what shall I do with these hands of mine? A special musical I tribute inspired by a province coming together in the face of tragedy. That's next. What shall I do? CBC Listen. Hear it all here. Download today. From the musical tributes to the silent ones. Canadians have been searching for ways to come together and pay tribute as a country. Many heeding today's request from the RCMP to wear red and to step outside for a moment's pause. A simple act to honor Constable Heidi Stevenson 
and all of the 22 victims. A message received from coast to coast. That feeling of wanting to help is something we've seen in stories all week. It's also the message Nova Scotia musician Dave Gunning captured in his song, These Hands. Dedicated to those affected by this tragedy and shared with the national. Some hills can stop a life from dying And some hills comfort a baby crying So tell me what shall I do with these hands of mine What shall I do with these hands of mine What shall I do with these hands of mine Stay strong, guys. The world could use a hero of the human kind. You are not alone. So tell me, what shall I do with these hands? All Canadians from Nova Scotia. I want to sing it from my heart. I want to hear it in the wind. Until it blows around the world and comes back again. And all we can ask is for ours to be free to use them when we want for whatever the need some hands give voice to a nation and some hands wrote the times they are a changing so tell me what shall i do with these hands of mine What shall I do With these hands of mine What shall I do With these hands of mine The world could use a hero Of the humankind So tell me what shall I do With these hands of mine So tell me what shall I do with these hands of mine? The moment is up next. Tonight we pay tribute to the 22 lives lost this week. We'll be right back. We show you these faces a lot, and that's on purpose. They are the 22 victims of last weekend's mass killing in Nova Scotia. And as we talk about the investigation into what happened and questions about how it all unfolded, we want them to remain a focus as well. And so as we wrap up the National on this April 24th, we leave you with this remembrance of the lives they lived before tragedy struck.